lectures on uh, open quantum systems given by Sebastian Dill that you've got to be introduced to already yesterday. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome to the second lecture. I mean, as yesterday, I, I remind you that, I mean, asking questions is really, really uh, very much desired, especially in, in view of, of slides that um, tend to go too fast, so please always interrupt me. Specifically, today's lecture yeah, will start with a few, I mean, technical wrap-ups for this uh, Keldish path integral, and then we'll, I, I want to put forward some applications <coughs> that illustrate, yeah, so uh, how uh, the microscopic breaking of equilibrium conditions morph to large-scale observable phenomena. And uh, a nice point about this is, I mean, I can stop essentially wherever in the middle, and we still have some, <coughs> at least if I don't mess up to totally, we still have some uh, result, yeah, and I can cut uh, parts of the second lecture, and in the third lecture we'll then apply this Keldish formalism to, um, to this measurement-induced uh, phase transition problem. So, please ask questions. So, um, just as a reminder for yesterday, we uh, started introducing uh, the Lindblad equation, yeah, which you can write compactly in this form. You have uh, the system um, density matrix. Time evolution is generated by a Heisenberg von Neumann commutator and then some dissipator. And if you write out all these terms, you recognize there is a both a left and right action onto the density matrix, and that is called, this, this whole Lindblad operator, which is the total thing here, is called a super operator, which still acts linearly onto the density matrix. So you can find an, formally an exponentiated solution, yeah, so that starts from some density matrix, uh, that's again here, yeah, and then evolves this density matrix on two time strings, simply because we need to transform every of these indices of the matrix over time. Yeah? So as in unitary evolution of a density matrix, this structure of two times, uh, I mean, sorting out of a density matrix generalizes um, to the open system evolution, as you can see here, yeah? left and right action. And what we then did was this um, Keldish path integral construction where the result is um, shown again here, just as a reminder, and in particular, I want to remind you of this fact that the action, the left or right action on the density matrix is remembered in the Keldish path integral by an additional index, yeah, which labels the contour, which labels the side on which the original operator was acting onto the density matrix. And you see here really nicely the structure that is written up here in the operatorial formalism really pops up again in this um, Lindblad um, action, if you like, uh, th that's written down here. Yeah? Precisely with the right prefactors that um, guarantee, for example, the probability conservation. Okay, and then we started with a few uh, structural uh, developments. First of all, we discussed um, the um, issue of probability conservation in this field theory and Although this sounds like very technical, I mean, of course, probability conservation or unitarity of quantum mechanics is really a very important symmetry of any physical evolution. And we use that here in the context later to motivate the operation of uh, the Keldish rotation, which um, starts from the observation that the Keldish action, unlike many other actions that you encounter, for example, for equilibrium problems, has the special property that it vanishes when we evaluate it on a configuration where we pin the configuration on the plus and on the minus contour to be the same. Yeah? So then this action vanishes and that motivated actually to introduce other coordinates to parameterize this action, not in this plus and minus contour basis, but to switch to a basis yeah, of center of mass and relative coordinates called Keldish rotation, this operation and the fields that are coming out of this uh, rotation here are called classical and quantum fields, they have the property that then the probability conservation property takes this neat form here that if we set one field to zero, namely the difference between plus and minus contour, then the action vanishes. And the interpretation of this field was that the classical field here can condense 
Yeah? It can acquire a finite expectation value, a field expectation value, so it can describe a spontaneous symmetry breaking phenomenon, while by construction, yeah, since the average of the since the um, average of the field inserted on the plus contour and on the minus contour yields identical averages, the quantum field can never acquire a finite expectation value, and that motivates this uh, denomination quantum field, a field that cannot uh, condense, that can just fluctuate. Good. Um, so this is also a good preparation yeah, to now step by step include uh, or try to understand or get a feeling for this Keldish action by, by step by step including fluctuations. Yeah? So one first um, thing is if you want to include fluctuations, maybe a good idea is to look at a limit where fluctuations are not very prominent. Yeah? So, and then we know what we are actually expanding about later on. And this is uh, what I uh, term here deterministic limit of the Keldish functional integral. So we notice that um, probability conservation is the property that if we take the field, actually the field phi q exactly to zero, yeah, so then this is probability conservation. And now, so the zero order uh, expansion in the quantum field is just probability conservation. Now I want to make the point that the first order expansion of the Keldish action in terms of the quantum field here um, leads to the deterministic limit. Yeah? So if we expand our action to first order in this quantum field, this will describe the physics of a single field configuration, in other words, a de de deterministic limit of this problem. Now, let's think about which is the circumstance under which this could occur. So what could be an ordering principle that really allows us to neglect everything which is not linear in this quantum field? And this is precisely the, um, the situation that you encounter when there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking in the problem. In this case, spontaneous symmetry breaking means that one momentum mode, there's a winner takes it all phenomenon, um, one momentum mode gets macroscopically occupied, so it scales with the square root of the number of system constituents. So that's the phenomenon of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, one mode really gets macroscopically occupied. And in real space, this means that the field actually, yeah, because of the Fourier transformation property, it scales like n to the zero. Conversely, the quantum field here, it can never acquire any um, macroscopic expectation value. It can never scale with system size. It will generically, in terms of a scaling argument, scale with the zero power of n. And therefore, if you go to real space, you, know, you see here a difference in scaling of the quantum versus the classical field, if we assume there's a condensation phenomenon going on. Now, therefore, we can then expand. We have now found a criterion or a, a principle that really allows us to expand to leading order in the quantum field, yeah, because it scales subleadingly compared to this classical field. And the result of this is then an action. Yeah? So I just take this action written in these uh, coordinates, classical and quantum field, and I expand it to first order in this quantum field. This will give me the leading contribution to the action. Yeah? And then we have actually an integral of the structure that you recognize, a, a Fourier uh, expansion uh, structure. We have something like that. I mean. Fourier would be this, Px equals a representation of a delta function. Yeah, and that's precisely the structure that we have up here. This P corresponds to phi quantum. This corresponds to D as D phi classical. Yeah, and therefore, you can see when I really drop every but this linear term in the quantum field, I'm representing here essentially a delta function for the classical equation of motion. The equation of motion is the, or the classical action principle. So the, the classical action here is minimized and that minimized means that it takes value zero and that's the only point and yeah, that's the only field configuration that will contribute to this whole 
path integral here. Yeah? So this is really how a summation over all possible configuration yeah, that is prescribed by this full functional integral here, how this collapses to the only contribution coming from the deterministic path from the one configuration that minimizes the classical action, the classical Heldish action. So, so no fluctuation included. Yeah? So the classical in the sense of no fluctuation contri contribute. Okay. So that is, uh, that is, um, I'm not assuming any specific form of the action here. Yeah? So we are looking at a very general theory, and I'm essentially deriving the classical action principle, if you like. Yeah? So, and it's only valid yeah? So when we have an argument yeah, why we could truncate the full action yeah, to linear order in this quantum field. Yeah? And that the intuition is really when we have a, a, a condensation phenomenon, yeah? So this is really then one, precisely this condensed field configuration gives the dominant contribution to the path integral. Like the subtle yeah. point it's, it's, it's less than the subtle point approximately. Subtle point usually means you look at quadratic fluctuations. This is even less. Uh, yeah? So I'm, I, of course we get to that, but I think it's always good yeah, to have a kind of intuition for a starting point and then we, so, so now we are looking at this black path, yeah, and then we'll explore also situations where other contributions contrib contribute. Yeah? So we'll build around that limit. So there were two questions, yeah? Yeah, I mean, so physically it's really this, this scenario. Yeah? So, so we need, we, to, in order to justify the operation of just expanding to linear order in the quantum field, we need an ordering principle. Yeah? So imagine the classical field would also, like without condensation phenomenon, yeah? it would also scale like n, n to the zero, yeah? uh, sorry, like n to the minus one half. Yeah? If there's no winner takes it all effect, no condensation around, then both these fields scale the same, and then you simply do not have the situation where one special field configuration dominates the whole summation prescribed by the functional integral. That's the point. Yeah? So really, the condensation phenomenon physically means winner takes it all. One field configuration is dominating the whole integral. Yeah? And that is really, so, so the physics is a macroscopic occupation of single modes. Bose condensation. Bose condensation. What we started yesterday with this uh, workhorse model, and we'll in great detail come back to that. That is a Bose condensation, a magnetization transition yeah, from a paramagnet into a ferromagnet. That's typically yeah, when you have extensive order parameters. That's the situation of, of, of one configuration dominates the problem. Any ordering? Yeah, right. So, so the classical, yeah, fluctuation less. Yeah? So there's just one path, one, one configuration dominating the story. There was another one. The, uh, uh, forgetting about the initial uh, condition is something that, <laughs> sorry? In, in the initial density matrix, it, technically it comes from taking the time of the initial time to minus infinity. Yeah? Physically, um, the, the point is that, I mean, dissipation, yeah? so when dissipation is in the game, yeah, indeed, I mean, you expect the system go to go to a stationary state, and we want to describe here the physics in stationary state, which is overriding any initial condition, right? So that's a, and, and, and so to say that the dissipative uh, tendon or couplings in the problem determine the, the form of the stationary state. That's one thing. Technically, it's actually not so trivial, but what you can do if you want to work hard, and one should do this, of course, once, you can take a damp harmonic oscillator and formulate really the initial value uh, as, uh, in, in this Keldish formalism, and then you can see really that if you take this time to minus infinity limit, the, the information on this 
initial condition dies out exponentially fast, but the physics is really this, yeah? a damp problem finds a stationary state that is independent of the initial condition. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be the, also, the situation, very interesting situations yeah, of MBL, for example. Uh, I think when, when you add openness, yeah, so I, I, I don't know of good examples. Yeah, so that would, uh, I mean, except you have something that is known as zero modes of this Lindblad operator. Yeah? If you have a zero mode, meaning that uh, there is a state in the system that is really not touched by this, uh, by this dissipation, that does not decay. And imagine that there's not only a zero, single zero mode, but a whole subspace of zero modes. Then this space will, subspace will remember the initial condition, and that's actually interesting effects like you can stabilize by dissipation, you can stabilize topological states of matter, and they, they typically are characterized by edge mode subspaces which are higher dimensional, higher than one, and which remember initial conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Good, okay, so we have now, uh, we appreciate now this uh, deterministic uh, limit, yeah, and we have really shown that, that I mean, uh, there is a technical way to convince ourselves that kind of the, there is a classical action principle, yeah, that, that uh, gives us a dominant configuration if we assume physically that there is this condensation phenomenon. Okay, and that's actually really, that, that comes back to your question. We have basically, from a completely different perspective yesterday, gotten the exact same result for a specific theory, namely for this workhorse Lindblad 5-4 theory, where we've seen really that, uh, I mean, or, where we've done a lot of heavy approximations, and we've seen in this way we can also model this condensation phenomenon. Yeah? So this total factorization of the density matrix in space, and then field theory, essentially. Okay, so let me summarize that. Uh, <laughs> I said it many times, yeah, but here is it's still a, a crisp summary. The deterministic limit of this Keldish functional integral is dominated by a single field configuration which minimizes, and maybe the better technical term is not the classical action, but the bare Keldish action, so the thing that's really up there in the exponent, sorry for the notation mismatch here, this should, could, could be just the S. Yeah. And it, the applications of this scenario, the physical uh, applications are Bose condensation, as we just said, or also, I mean, there's an interesting connection to this field uh, of non-permission physics, yeah, which basically looks at, um, um, flux, at, um, dissipate, at non-hermission Hamiltonians, so Hamiltonians which have a, a Hermitian and an anti-Hermitian part, both of them occur, yeah, so that's just, uh, and, and, and this, finds a systematic um, explanation in this framework in the sense of you could regard this as the deterministic limit of a Keldish action problem. Yeah? And then you can ask, so why could this be a good idea? And the answer is here on the, on the blackboard. Yeah? So this is a good idea, for example, if you deal with classical wave optics. Yeah? So then um, you will uh, be able to describe this system kind of systematically in, in such a deterministic limit of, of the Keldish path integral. And maybe I give you another piece of intuition. Yeah? So uh, I, coming back to the statement I made yesterday, um, another way of, of looking at that is the system has a collective degree of freedom. Yeah? So, and this is the circumstance when, when there's a collective degree of freedom, you can neglect fluctuations. Yeah? And examples come from our classical world, like, like the damped harmonic oscillator, yeah? so although formally this is not probability conserving, this dynamics, yeah? so you could add some noise um, to, um, to this damped harmonic oscillator, it's just not necessary because this uh, co coordinate that oscillates is a highly collective coordinate made of many uh, microscopic particles, and the energy scale on which this oscillates, it's much, much bigger than Kb times uh, the, bol the Boltzmann constant times temperature, yeah, so that uh, fluctuations in this problem are really negligible. Yeah. So that is really applications, if you like, of the deterministic limit of this Keldish functional integral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. also, uh, can you yes. Yeah. 
conversation can't come yeah. so right that's why you wrote yeah. the other so if you want yeah mm -hmm. if you want to model I, I can give you the recipe. Yeah? So if, if I give you a, a Lindblad equation and you want to see what is the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian and when first and when, when is it justified. Yeah? So these, these two points are important to answer. Yeah? So then I, you, give, I, you give me your Lindbladian. I write this Keldish path integral. I do this Keldish rotation. I compute this. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I, I, I would have to comp no? Um, I, I compute this, this Keldish action, I do this Keldish rotation, and then I ask myself, well, in this problem, is there actually a collective variable in place? Yeah? For example, is there a Bose condensation going on, or, I mean, is there a photon condensation going on? Classical optics is photon condensation. Yeah? And then you have a good reason to neglect the noise. And you could, and then your non-Hermitian Hamiltonian is really basically um, uh, standing here. Yeah? So it is, you get the time evolution for the field expectation value for the field. Yeah? And on the right-hand side of this equation stands your non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And that's the, mm -hmm. So you have to set the quantum field to Well, I mean, here we actually didn't set it to zero. We actually integrated it out exactly. Yeah? So it was not a, I mean, the approximation was I can linearize the action in the quantum field. And then I recognize, oh, there's an integral prescribed yeah, from the Keldish path integral over the quantum field. But since it only occurs linearly, I can just do this integration by using the, the identity of, I mean, the functional uh, re delta representation, or Fourier representation of a delta function. Yeah? And this delta function pins all the configurations of S phi C yeah, to zero, which is the classical equation of motion. It's actually really an exact treatment of phi C if the approximation of phi Q in, <laughs> in linear is, is justified. And there we need some physics to justify that. Okay, more? Good. So, then we come a bit to fluctuations. Yeah. So, classical um, field theory, so you could, can look generally of uh, field theories in this way. It doesn't matter if Keldish or some other field theory, but classical physics, classical field theories, they are really a single field configuration determines everything, so that's really a deterministic theory. Classical theories are deterministic, but quantum and statistical field theories, yeah, so they have this property, Keldish or not, yeah, so that you really sum over all accessible, all possible field configurations yeah, beyond this classical path. Yeah? So they are, in this sense, probabilistic. Yeah? So there's a kind of probability weight associated to every of these other um, field configurations. Now, specifically in the Keldish, we've now seen probability conservation, zero order and quantum field, deterministic limit, first order and quantum field, and now what about when we want to quantify deviations away from this deterministic limit. Yeah? And the kind of um, correlations that measure the de departure from the uh, deterministic limit, they come in two flavors. One of them, because now we have these two field variables, if we want to look at it purely mathematically, yeah? we have what is called correlation functions. They measure the strength, the picture is, they measure the strength of fluctuations away from the deterministic configuration, and they are sort of encoded in averages of this type here. Yeah? In the deterministic limit, yeah, as we've seen, yeah, so every information is just in the field expectation value, so then uh, in the deterministic limit this factorizes, and whenever you find a deviation from this factorization, you, can know, you, you know that must be the effect of fluctuations away from this deterministic limit. The other class, of um, correlation functions yeah, so is uh, what is in the context of the Keldish path integral known as a response function. Yeah? So this uh, describes the impact that's really a structurally different question you're asking to the system. Here you're asking how strong 
is the impact of an external perturbation. Yeah? So this is a system intrinsic property here, measures how strong are fluctuations away from the deterministic limit. This thing here will give you an answer. I put an external probe field and then I want to know how the system reacts. That's the response function. Okay, and now I give you the prescription, yeah, how you can compute these two objects and hopefully along the way still get a little bit more intuition about them. So to this end, what you do, you introduce source terms, yeah, as maybe you're familiar from that with in statistical mechanics, you introduce source terms yeah, with the idea that you can use these source terms here to generate correlation functions. Yeah? You, if you take the variational derivative of this object here, or maybe written in this Keldish basis here, you can see, aha, uh -huh, I get the phi c down, downstairs in the expectation value by just taking a derivative with respect to j quantum star in this case. Mm -hmm. So this would give me, generate me um, the, the field expectation value. And then we can go do more. Yeah? We can take more derivatives. For example, we get what I introduced as the single particle response function by taking another derivative, however now with respect to this JC field yeah, in, the, in this basis. Yeah, and you can see, aha, uh -huh, indeed, this is the structure I was announcing on the previous slide. And you also have hopefully a little bit of intuition now yeah, what, what this correlation, this uh, abstract uh, correlation function here means. Well, it just means I have this expectation value, and now I wiggle a little bit with an external field JC, and um, to linear order, yeah, I get this correlation function. Yeah? So this is linear response theory in this Keldish formalism. Yeah? You can think about this extremely physically. Yeah? I, I think of a, a, a cavity model that we looked at yesterday, yeah? so just a damped harmonic oscillator, and so the Hamiltonian is omega naught, a dagger a, and now I add something like a source term, you know, j times um, a plus a dagger, or a something like that. Yeah. Then I do a Keldish, uh, then I, I transfer this into uh, Keldish action, yeah, and I get, uh, in terms of the Keldish action for this term here, I get integral over t, j plus a plus emission conjugate minus j minus a minus. And now I say, okay, this should be really, this J should be an external a physical source, yeah? so it should not carry uh, a Keldish index here. And uh -huh, now you see, so this is, let me, this is the classical JC, and now you see, okay, this is indeed JC A plus minus A minus. Yeah? So a classical external source, a real field that I impose onto the system, it couples precisely to this A quantum field in the Keldish path integral. So that is the intuition, a, a real physical, classical external source. It couples right away to this quantum field, and that, that's exactly what stands up here. Yeah? Without uh, having any physical picture, we can go to this. But that's the physical meaning of this, um, of this responses. OK, and then, I mean, as, a, as one more piece of information, yeah, you can in a once and for all a little bit tedious and technical way, which I don't do in the lectures here, you can also relate these correlators here of the Keldish path integral to actually really correlators in the operator formalism. Yeah, so that's oftentimes useful in practical calculations here yeah, to know, okay, what does this object actually stand for in the operator formalism? There must be a one-to-one -one translation if you do everything in the correct way and then as a piece of information that I give you, yeah, so it's precisely the commutator of fields for in the bosonic field case. Now, let's come to this other class of correlators that, uh, that I was uh, specifying, namely those with the phi c, phi c star. Yeah, so here, I just go kind of by, uh, by the 
formalism here, how to generate this correlation function here. Well, I have to take the twice a derivative with respect to these quantum fields. And as a piece of information, yeah, so the best intuition I can give you for that is really that this measures deviations from the deterministic limit. And so we just try to find a way how to generate that in this formulation here. And then relating it to the operator formalism, it is not the commutator that it represents, it's the anti-commutator that it represents. And if you evaluate the anti-commutator at equal times, yeah, then this pre describes precisely how strongly states are occupied. So that's another interpretation of this correlation function, of the equal time correlation function. It is how states are occupied, yeah? two times the occupation number plus one, which comes from, I mean, using commutation relations on this anti commutator Yes? J is an external source here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's what I tried here. Yeah, so maybe maybe <laughs> I'm in between doing it too long and <laughs> and uh, um, what I tried here. Yes, think of this is a term. Yeah, so you can imagine I really start wiggling. Yeah, I I, I have a driving yeah to, of of this harmonic oscillator with an external source that I call J. Often it's also called omega. If this is really a physical classical field, yeah it will not undergo this construction on the plus and minus contour, of course, yeah? because it's a parameter for this theory and not a fluctuating, and not an operator. The operators, they get an index because I have to represent them in terms of coherent state, but external fields are parameters, they don't get an index. Yeah? And I mean, if you then say, okay, I, I essentially, I'm, I'm only going this term here. Yeah? If I pull this through in the Keldish construction, then there is never an index. Yeah? Because it's just an external parameter, but and but and this physical field here it couples to the difference of operators then. Yeah? And that gives us then an interpretation of now I'm I think too close. That gives us an interpretation of um, this more more formal construction here, where I just to to be able to, to get all fields down by taking derivatives gives us an interpretation of the classical component to this. Yeah? This is really a physical field that I can wiggle, and the J-quantum is an object that I just need in order for it to be able, say, to, to represent this correlator here as a functional variational derivative. Okay? That's the point. Yeah? It's a bit technical, this part of <laughs> but it's also an important, uh, important stuff, and I think if we miss it out, then you can't really understand the sequel. Yeah? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe wait a bit. We, we come to the structure that, that emerges uh, in the end. Yeah? So then, then, we, then we can get back to this question. Okay, right. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah? So you assemble then. Yeah? So we, we want to, in, in field theory, we want then to build a Green's function. And because of this two indices, C and Q, yeah, we should get a, a two by two a Green's function structure. Yeah? And the structure that we find for this problem is, okay, here is this G Keldish yeah, defined in this way. Then we have the retarded Green's function that we just put, put it here in the upper corner. And then there is the Hermitian conjugate to that, yeah, which comes when you exchange JC to JC star and JQ to star to JQ. Yeah? So then you get what is known as the advanced Green's function if you translate back to the operator language it has support on the other sign of the theta function. So these are relations that you can then pretty neatly see. I mean, I, I don't want to prove them all, but just give as a piece of information. So we have all details, if you like, in, in, in this review here. So let me now come to this structure. Yeah, you, you've noticed, yeah, some people have already noticed um, in advance, yeah, so that there is a zero down there. Yeah, so which relates to probability conservation. So let's see again. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see how this comes about. 
And to this end, yeah, I, I don't develop, again, the full theory that would be uh, stretching it, but we can go here via an example. Yeah? We get, just go via a simple example, and you take my word that this generalizes to full, th full interacting theories in a spatial continuum. Yeah? But I, I don't prove this here. Let, let's just see with an example. It gives you the right picture. So here what I did is I take this damned harmonic oscillator uh, master equation that we, uh, that we really carefully translated to Keldish yesterday, and then I, I write it in um, these uh, classical and quantum fields. I write it out. You see here, oh, there is this zero, and this zero is precisely necessary yeah, as a consequence of probability conservation. I mean, it comes out from the, from the calculation, but it also must be like that because I have this probability conservation is the property that the action vanishes when I set the quantum field to zero, and that's why there has to be a zero in this corner, because this zero pre-multiplies -multiply, uh, phi quantum of t times zero times, if you stretch out this bilinear, yeah, it multiply, it comes, it, it is this uh, contraction of the matrix, yeah, so there must be a zero, because otherwise if there were anything non-zero, yeah, so then I would immediately violate this property. Okay? That's how it is, yeah? and this is much more general than in the um, and then in the, this simple problem because of this general property also there. And um, then we can go to Fourier space, and the claim is now that this object that stands here, this, yeah, there's a lot of notation now, the claim is that this thing that stands here is actually the inverse of the Green's function. Who is familiar with such a statement? Then I know how quickly I can go there. Who's familiar? Okay, I go mid-speed. <laughs> then, so I, I think, yeah, I, I write down a formula yeah, so that reminds you of this, here is the inverse of a matrix, and this inverse is the Green's function of the problem. So um, let me do this in a kind of matrix notation. Yeah? So S, I write it now in general, sum A, B, phi A, G minus 1, phi B. They start for a complex action, doesn't matter Keldish or not. Yeah? And then we have the Gaussian integral minus i times, all the i's are now important, sum a, yeah, so this is, I mean, a matrix notation for the action in the presence of uh, sources, yeah? so this a index is time, continuous time index and Keldish index, yeah? quantum and classical, that I'm representing here, and the result of this integration normalization times e to the minus a b g a b yeah, so the inverse of this matrix here phi b with n the normalization given by the determinant of g minus 1 okay so that is the that is um, how we can convince ourselves that indeed I mean, this object here is the Green's function because we can, I mean, for the simple harmonic theory here, we just do this integral here. That's precisely what I just did, what I just did. Yeah, so this average here, there, there's, uh, I have, I have the, this quadratic action standing here, and if I do this integral, no, doesn't want, then I get here the inverse of this G minus 1 matrix, and then I can argue, okay, this is our definition of the Green's function in terms of variations of the partition function with respect to these external sources. And on the other hand, I, so I can act with these derivatives on this formula, or I can act with these derivatives on this formula after I have done the integration, and then I get, you know, by, by then this G function comes down. So this tells me indeed this relation. This thing here is precisely the inverse, uh, is the Green's function. And the inverse of the Green's function occurs here as the action kernel. Yeah? Good. 
So summary of this, yeah? we write the inverse Green's function, we write it not really willing. We write this kernel like this, yeah? with this, <laughs> now it's totally random. Stabilized again. We write the inverse Green's function in this parameterization yeah, with this P, A, P, R, P, K, and the zero representing probability conservation. And then we invert this object, yeah, just do it mathematically. We see, aha, uh -huh, the zero that pops up here shows up down here. Yeah? And this precisely tells us now the interpretation of this zero, so the second variation with respect to the um, classical field here that is probability conservation again that implies this. Yeah? And, and again, I say this is, uh, I mean, now specifically done explicitly for a quadratic problem, but it's, it generalizes to interacting theories, this structure. Probability conservation implies here is a zero. Okay, good. So let's go quickly with an example, and then we are through with the, with the technical um, developments. Uh, namely, I mean, if you want, for example, what is really a concrete example for a response function in the real-time domain, well, then, I mean, we can uh, compute the, um, the um, time, uh, Fourier transform of the retarded Green's function in, in the frequency domain, and we find this structure here, as we expect, yeah, for a damped harmonic oscillator, there's a decay with rate kappa, and on top of it, some oscillations with frequency omega naught that shows up here in the oscillator, the imaginary part of the frequency uh, domain uh, Green's function is known as the spectral density for the problem, and for this um, damp problem, the spectral density is just a Lorentzian function. This is also something that you might recognize from other formulations of, of physical problems. And when we come now to an example for the correlation functions, yeah, and we specifically look at the correlation functions at equal time, I was saying, this gives us the occupation of this mode. So let's do it for um, this damp cavity. What's your expectation? What should be the mode occupation for this damp cavity? How many particles are there in the cavity in the infinite time limit? Particle density there, the, the occupation density expectations. I guess there should not be much left. Yeah? If I just have a decaying cavity, <laughs> We expect certainly that there's no uh, density left, and indeed this comes out of this calculation. Yeah, so here we understand that this equal time keldish greens function is two times the occupation number plus one, and if you go through the calculation and just do this integral here, you find, aha, uh -huh, this is indeed one. So this means that the n, the physical expectation value, is, is really zero, yeah, totally in line with expectations. So summary, the correlation functions encoded in G. Keldish here, they give us statistical properties, how modes are occupied and how strong are deviations from the deterministic configuration. And the response here gives us what is also known as spectral properties. It tells us how, so to say, a system responds when we hit it. Yeah? So and then you will see some oscillations and these oscillations then pound. So that's the interpretation of these quantities. Okay. Good, so now here you see how slow we are, but that's totally fine. We can smoothly go to the, um, to the, next, um, to the next topic and now look at, in this framework that we just uh, acquired now, at a real um, many-body problem where we do, again, this workhorse Lindbladian that I already explained yesterday. So it's a many-body system with a Hamiltonian with kinetic energy and with interactions, and we have then in the dissipative sector single particle pumping single particle losses and two body losses. Okay, let's now look at the Keldish action for this precise problem, doing all the steps. Somehow it's pretty tedious, but this is the result. It's also very straightforward, tedious, but really straightforward. This is the structure of the Keldish action in the uh, after Keldish rotation that we get out. Yeah? Here you recognize indeed the structure that I was advertising for the damped harmonic oscillator with the difference, yeah, so that in the single particle sector here, now we have spatial degrees of freedom, not only a temporal degree of freedom, but we also have spatial degrees of freedom which show up then as 
So the kinetic energy, for example, has this momentum square over 2m. Yeah? We also see yeah, so that um, there is decay parts in the single particle sector. So this is the single particle loss rate. This is the single particle pump, single body pumping rate. And then on this uh, Keldish component here, we have also these two scales showing up with the interesting point yeah, so that in this um, PR, Keldish uh, Green's function, the difference of loss and pumping occurs. And in this uh, PK sector, just as an observation, the sum of them occurs. Yeah. And um, so let's get a bit um, into what this physically means. I want to do two things now. I want to um, use actually this asymmetry that occurs here to do simplifications in the limit yeah, that this uh, loss minus pumping parameter here becomes very small. So this means that we pump the system as strongly, almost as strongly as we lose particles. And this intuitively gives you, the, gives you an instability of the system. Yeah? When you pump harder than you lose, then in the end you would pump in as many particles as you like. But physically, remember, we have the two-body loss in the problem. So this will give us a stabil stable uh, situation where the, the pumping, this overpumping of the system is actually compensated by two body losses and gives us a stable state of matter. Yeah? But upshot, yeah, whenever I make this parameter small, I'm tuning myself close to a phase transition, close to an instability to, a, to this condensation that we already studied yesterday. So, and, and this mathematically, this will allow us to take a limit of the Keldish path integral, which is more intelligent than the deterministic limit. It's more than that, but still doesn't have the complexity of the full Lindblad equation. Yeah? And it's a very close to a critical point. This is very often a very good idea. In generic situations, it's a good idea. Yeah. Sorry? There's a massive meaning. Yeah? So it, the action has to vanish when phi quantum is zero. I can never write a term which is purely, so it's, it's this relation that stands up there. Yeah? A very good observation, yeah? and it's precisely this. There cannot be a term which only has classical fields. Then we would violate probability conservation. Yeah? So it's, it, it, it's a very deep property that, that surfaces everywhere in these theories. Totally right. More questions? Very good that you are following, so on this level. Indeed, I forgot, totally forgot. Uh, good that you're reminding me. I totally forgot to mention, yeah, so that our non-linearities, yeah, so they are also now processed in this uh, Keldish rotation. For example, this parameter, this was in the microscopic model, the elastic collisions. Hmm? And the kappa was the two particle losses. Yeah? And you can see here, this uh, lambda parameter, so the, the elastic collisions, they come up in this combinations, and the, 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 the two-body losses, they come with even and with odd instances of the quantum field. But everything is linear, at least linear in the quantum field, otherwise we prob violate probability conservation. So this is a fantastic sanity check to verify S of phi quantum equals zero. Okay, let's take this limit, yeah, and actually we'll, even be able to connect it back to this deterministic limit. But as an excursion or to motivate that, I would like to introduce a physical problem, yeah. which is uh, borrowed from condensed matter physics, so-called exciton polariton condensates. People describe these in terms of what is known as Langevin equation, just a second to go. And then we'll connect our semi-classical limit of the Keldish path integral to precisely this Langevin equation. That gives us a picture on how this re re relates and also gives us a prescription. Yeah? If, you, if I give you a Keldish integral problem and you want to connect it to Langevin, then this is the path that we are now developing. Okay, exciton polaritons. These are semiconductor heterostructures. So you have here three layers of a semiconductor and these green ones, they are extremely highly reflective. Yeah? So they form like a um, cavity where light can then bounce back and forth and this light can actually be coupled to the exciton degrees of freedom. These are particle hole excitations in a semiconductor. 
they're just called excitons here. And let me look here at the uncoupled scenario, where I just look at the dispersion relation for the photons that are confined into this yellow plane. This will be a quadratic dispersion. Of course, photons are relativistic, linear dispersion. But due to the confinement in the z direction up here, they, they become non-relativistic. They get a huge gap. So they behave like non-relativistic particles in this plane, if you like. And the excitons on the scale of the curvature of the, pho um, uh, of the photons, they, they are absolutely flat. Yeah. Now, as I said, you can couple these guys. Yeah, and when you couple them, yeah, you get actually the, the effective. So it's really diagonalizing a quadratic form where you have coupling on the off diagonal. And then you get actually these gray lines here as the real eigenmodes of this uh, system here. And then you can pump one of the eigenmodes, yeah, you just come in with a laser and uh, make it, put, put it in resonance with this upper branch here, upper so-called polaritons, yeah, these hybrid particles um, of excitons and, 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 and photons, these polaritons, you pump the upper branch, this is unstable, it's a dirty piece of condensed matter, and these modes will decay, and in particular, they will feed the lower polariton branch in an incoherent way. Upshot, we cannot go into all details. It will give us an in incoherent, a single particle pumping of the lower polariton degrees of freedom here. So this is this process. Of course, these lower polaritons are also not totally stable excitations of matter because these mirrors of the cavity here, they are again a bit lossy, so you will lose excitons and you will not lose them as single excit uh, sorry, polaritons. You will also lose them in pairs. So this is then what these people describe this problem, typically, in terms of this stochastic driven dissipative cross pedaevsky equation. So here you, they study the um, amplitude evolution of these lower polariton degrees of freedom. And it is, there is some propagation of these modes. Yeah? So that is this curvature of this lower polariton branch here gives you an effective mass here. Then there is pump and loss processes, as I was motivating. Yeah? They come up in this. Uh, fashion here. There's elastic collisions between these, these polaritons, and there's also these two body losses that we mo motivated phenomenologically. If you want to structure, and there's of course this noise. Hmm? If you want to structure this problem a little bit, you can recognize here a structure that we also found in the Lindblad equation. There is some coherent evolution of this field amplitude here. There's some dissipative evolution of this field amplitude. And now the element, there is also this element of noise, a random force that acts on the system. And this has precisely this idea that the system is now allowed to explore configurations beyond a single one. Imagine I put off this noise. So then I have here really a deterministic equation which has uh, both uh, reversible dynamics and irreversible dissipative dynamics, then we are in this limit of non-emission systems, if you like. But now we have a random force that attacks the system all the time from the outside, and this kicks the configuration around in possible configuration space. So there must be some really clear relation between this path integral way of thinking about configurations, yeah, summing over many configurations, and this stochastic concept where we have introduced something explicit that kicks around the field configuration and in this way allows to explore configurations of this deterministic path. So now I want to sharpen this precise connection as a special limit of the Keldish path integral. This equation should come out. Yeah? Let's see how this works. Ah, uh, none of them. <laughs> so the, the, the um, polaritons, yeah? so, so I mean, so it's pretty indirect. Yeah? So, so the polaritons, you can formulate a Hamiltonian for excitons, a Hamiltonian for photons. You diagonalize this Hamiltonian, you get the polaritons, and you get also polariton elastic interactions. Yeah? And then there is dirt in this condensed matter piece. 
<laughs> that allows the, that, or I mean, really very concretely, yeah, so these mirrors here are lossy. Yeah, so the photon has not only Hamiltonian, it also has decay. Yeah, so you would have to start from a Lindblad where you have a Hamiltonian describing the photons and the decay of the photons. And that is all, I mean, in this phenomenological way, priced in, in <laughs> so, condensed uh, matter way. Yeah. Good. Okay, so again, I mean, the physics of these systems here, I mean, uh, Bose condensation yeah, has been observed in such systems, yeah, so, and they obey, and, and you can see this uh, Bose condensation yeah, by, by dropping everything that is complicated in this problem, yeah, so no spatial dependence, let's look for a stationary state, and let's forget about the noise, and then again, we come to this intuition, I want to emphasize it again, it's a little repetitive, yeah, but you see when, so that's basically the equation we wrote already yesterday as this mean field limit of the Lindblad equation. Yeah? So it's all very strongly related. And you see here, or, or the solution of this simple equa algebraic equation gives you when the pump exceeds the loss, well, then you get a condensation going on. Yeah? Okay, so how does this relate to Lindblad? That was we, we want to explore now. Yeah? And so now we go back uh, to this more technical discussion. Yeah? and try to simplify this action again, yeah? but in a little bit more um, cautious way than we did that in the deterministic limit. Yeah? There is one important observation, and that is this. Um, when I tune the system to the critical point of, uh, of the, to the instability, to the condensation instability, then this parameter here goes to zero. Yeah? So this means that this retarded and advanced uh, inverse keldish greens function here, they scale with, say, momentum square. Because the, the constant term is removed precisely by this fine tuning to the critical point. Conversely, this piece here entering the inverse keldish greens function, well, this has, sees nothing special. You get, okay, gamma loss equals gamma pump, but this is a function that scales with q to the zero power. Yeah? So there's no scaling. And now you can go back to your quantum field theory course yeah? and do a, what is called tree-level randomization group analysis or a canonical power counting for your action. Yeah? You require that an action, it appears in the exponent, yeah? and an action appears in the exponent of a functional integral, so it must be a dimensionless quantity. And you require that the total action is, is dimensionless, and, in, and we know also the scaling yeah, of all the ingredients of the Green's function here. Yeah? And in this way, by requiring the total action be dimensionless, we can figure out the scaling dimensions of the classical and the quantum field. And because of this mismatch in scaling of retarded advanced and Keldish component of the Green's function, one finds that the scaling dimensions of these fields are different. They split off. Yeah? So there is a strong asymmetry, again, between scaling of quantum and classical field here. And the observation is in particular when you apply this counting here for the fields to the quartic terms, you will see that the more quantum fields there are in a nonlinear term, the more irrelevant this is in the sense of the randomization group. And the statement that you can see is that in dimensions larger than two, couplings, yeah, for as a nonlinear couplings here with more than two quantum fields are totally irrelevant in the sense of the randomization group. So we drastically simplify the structure of the action by immediately skipping these terms. Yeah, so this really is a massive simplification of the problem. And in particular, I will now show you how this simplification brings us precisely to this Langevin equation in very clean terms. Yeah. Okay, so that's the agenda. So first of all, I write down the action that we get when we do this simplification, when we drop these, uh, these nonlinear terms that, that are RG irrelevant. Yeah. So even if you did not maybe follow all the fully the, the, the argument, uh, let, let's, let's keep in mind yeah, so that we can massively simplify by RG irrelevance arguments the action in a way that the only terms that remain are linear in the quantum field, but now also something that is quadratic in the quantum field, but nothing more. 
all these nonlinear terms except this one, which is linear in the quantum field, all they, they are gone. Hmm? Okay, so what does this buy us? It's just a formula to begin with, but now we can show that this actually brings an equivalence to these Langevin equations. So, um, and this is done here. So here I recall the structure of this action, you know, something that is linear in the quantum field, something that is quadratic in the quantum field, and this here is the action that we have to vary in order to produce this term. Yeah? So, and it has precisely a reversible contribution and a, a decay contribution, which comes with an I in front. Okay, so now we want to manipulate this path integral further to see the connection to Langevin equations. And a nice trick that you do here is we want to get rid of this quadratic term in the quantum field and we want to make it actually linear. This idea yeah, of decoupling field powers is in some context known as hubbard satonovich decoupling, but even without this word, I just give you the simple identity where I have to watch the signs that, that shows you how I can get rid of or how I can decouple this quadratic term is this identity, say for a single complex um, integration, yeah, and, and of course we have here uh, functional integrals, but the identity that we really need is this. So this is again a nice Gaussian integral with, when I do this integration, I get the result I, I two gamma. This is the result of this integration. Yes. So, or in other words, when I start from this term here, as it's the case up there, I can read the equation this way to what is known as decouple this term, decouple in the sense that now I produce something that is really linear in this quantum field. And when we have a situation that is linear in the quantum field, we know what to do, because that's exactly what we did previously. We just integrate over the quantum field yeah, and produce here, so, so that is the action after this decoupling yeah, so with this psi field. This here is the variation of the uh, bare action. And I can use now again the representation of the delta function in terms of a Fourier uh, transformation to produce now the delta constraint that we had previously. So this is just the variation of the bare action, yeah. this thing. But now there is this shift risk psi. This shift risk psi came from decoupling the quadratic field, uh, quadratic term in quantum fields. And what it means, yeah, this psi, if, comes out when we just read this formula, what it means. Yeah? So there is a shift in psi, and this psi is a random variable with Gaussian distribution. And this is precisely what is, describes a Langevin equation. Yeah? So it is essentially the classical equation of motion that we got in the deterministic limit augmented by a random force whose statistics is prescribed by this hubbard sotonovich decoupling psi term. So this is the, um, this is the, the idea. Yeah? So we can get this um, driven dissipative Langevin equation here as a um, semi-classical limit, yeah, where we dropped higher order terms in the quantum field than quadratic uh, by good arguments, yeah, namely being close to a critical point. Yeah, so uh, we could simplify the problem to, to this, and we show down that this simplified semi-classical limit of the Keldish path integral is equivalent to this Langevin equations. Okay, are there questions for this? Okay. Good. So now this is the picture that, that you, uh, physical picture that you can get out of this. So there is a kind of really um, um, weak universality yeah, that comes just from doing this semi-classical limit. Yeah? So in some sense, you could look at this Lindblad 5-4 theory that we looked at, yeah? 
close to a critical point or this exciton polariton microphysics, yeah, they, we can all describe this in terms of very complicated microscopic Lindblad equations. But when we coarse grain yeah, in the vicinity of a critical point, yeah, close to the con onset of the condensation phenomenon, yeah, so then this problem simplifies actually to a, to a Langevin problem. Yeah, and from there, yeah, from such a mesoscopic starting point, one could then do actually more sophisticated calculation to really extract the, the macroscopic um, uh, physics out of that. And th this is really a, a, a reflection of this concept of universality that, so to say, if you coarse grain, if you zoom out of the problem, then often simplifications uh, occur that, um, um, that make the problem a little bit more um, easy to tackle. Yeah. Right, I mean, so, so the, the question can be, now what did we drop? Yeah, so is this actually, <laughs> so um, is this, uh, maybe you can formulate it, is it justified to, to drop these quantum couplings? Yeah? And you can, I mean, these arguments, they hold, I mean, on very general grounds, close to a critical point, yeah? except for fine-tuned situations, yeah? that, that this noise level also, so this P Keldish has a zero, but let's assume this is not the case. And then you can ask, okay, if I, if I keep all these terms, yeah, for example, in an RG flow calculation, I, I don't know this argument, I haven't heard of it, so I keep all these other terms, what will they do? Yeah, so that's maybe a way of reformulating your question. And then you can do that and you will see that these terms have lower or weaker infrared divergences, yeah, so they will drop out of the randomization group flow even if you take them into account. And that is, so to say, telling you that this argument, this high-level argument really works. But you can also keep all these terms if you have very much time. <laughs> you do the heavy calculation and you will see there is a fine difference yeah, in, in leading infrared divergences that are coming from these fluctuations, while these quantum fluctuations, they are really overshadowed by, by those. Yeah? So there is an interesting fine structure in quantum versus classical fluctuations, yeah, or, yeah, so that, that are, um, so that under these conditions, you can really see the quantum fluctuations are suppressed. Yeah. It's a little bit like the finite temperature phase transitions versus zero temperature phase transitions. Yeah. So finite temperature means finite noise level in this more general language here. And of course, it's interesting yeah, to look at also a situation where this is manifestly violated. This is the analog of quantum phase transitions that also exists in such systems. But I mean, that's now, I can't discuss everything. Further questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a very good question. Yeah, so you can formulate it quite generally, yeah, so what is, um, which concepts of physics yeah, translate to this out of equilibrium realm and which don't? Yeah? And if you think about a spontaneous symmetry breaking, it is a concept that works in and out of equ equilibrium no matter. Yeah? So there is a laser, yeah? a laser, lasing mode is a spontaneous symmetry breaking of phase rotation symmetry. Yeah? So this concept has nothing to do with in or out of equilibrium. And, and therefore, yes, of course, yeah, it's just a matter of, of how can we see that in this formalism <laughs> that uh, there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking phenomenon. But this is not, I mean, spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's one mode gets macroscopically occupied, that's exactly what happens in a laser, so there's, it's not conditioned on equilibrium. But it's actually an, a good thing yeah, to, to always think, yeah, is this effect, is this question I'm asking very specific to equilibrium or not? Further? Good, so this is the wrap up of this section here. Yeah, so so what, we, what we did, essentially, so we went along this line here. Yeah? We started from the Lindblad equation and we mapped it into this lindblad keldish functional integral. Yeah? So then we did, the, as a last step, yeah, we, we, more, we took a limit, yeah, the semi-classical limit, and we mapped then this complex Keldish functional integral under certain circumstances that are not always present, we could map it into a simpler 
object, yeah? something that is, for example, relevant to this exciton polariton concrete systems. Yeah? And from this here, from this functional integral formulation, we translated it to a Langevin equation formulation of the problem. So, so the upper ones are always equivalences, and the, then there's a, there's a limiting case that you go when, when we walk from up, up down. Yeah? And actually, I would like to embed this a little bit more into formulations of, of, of um, quantum statistical problems, quite in general. Yeah? Namely, there is always a formulation in terms of deterministic evolution of probabilistic objects. Yeah? Very strange formulation, but a density matrix yeah, or a pr is a kind of a probability distribution. So, and under this Lindblad equation, it evolves deterministically. I don't see any noise in the Lindblad equation, yeah? but I'm evolving a probabilistic object. So there's always one formulation of this type, yeah? a deterministic evolution of probabilistic objects. And then there's always another alternative way of formulating the problem in terms of a stochastic process. So here, we build in explicitly some noise, yeah? and you've seen how this noise comes out of, for example, this construction, transiting from a functional integral, from a probabilistic, to this Langevin formulation. So this is a quite a general principle in, in, in theories in that, that you can formulate deterministic, probabilistic theories, or stochastic versions of it. And for the quantum problem, this would actually be the Heisenberg-Langevin equation here, in the quantum case, and uh, also this stochastic Schrödinger equation that we we'll get to know in the, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, here, these two lines here, so these, these two lines are, I, I like to refer to them as essentially, or, or all of these here, sorry, all of these, they are differential formulations, so we are evolving forward something one time step by time step, while, I mean, these integral formulations here, yeah, so this is like the uh, integrated, integral version of the Schrödinger equation, yeah, where one has one deals with exponentiated, exponentiated evolution operators and essentially how they do propagate over a whole time string. Yeah? So this is kind of the structure of theories that, that we are dealing with here. Okay, so now uh, comes this question yeah, that I mean goes in the direction of what you were saying or asking. So um, when we have now this Lindblad equation, how do we see even that we are out of equilibrium? Yeah? So now I would like to discuss a bit this question. Yeah? So what is non-equilibrium about this Lindblad equations? It's pretty intuitive. You're pumping, you're hammering here on this density matrix. And um, so how do we quantify that really more precisely? How would we, if I give you kind of a Keldish action, can you tell me if this is in or out of equilibrium? So that's the question. Okay, and, and a little bit of, um, I mean, again, embedding also in, in the series of lectures here. So there is very many notions of what out of equilibrium actually means, and a very uh, prominent um, way of, of saying, oh, this system is out of, of equilibrium is, of course, when it really still time evolves. Yeah? So time translation invariance, if this is broken explicitly, for example, I quench the system and then I let the evolution go, then I can study phenomena like thermalization, or if I even time-dependently drive my, my system, yeah, so then I will reach this realm of Floquet systems, and all of this you've, uh, you've been um, seeing here. Yeah? Now, what we are, the notion of non-equilibrium we are discussing in these lectures is a little different. Yeah? It is really the... Um, the, the, the notion of non-equilibrium in the sense of stationary flux equilibrium states. Yeah? So, and I, a point that I would like to stress, yeah, because it also often leads to confusion, um, detecting such flux equilibria, it is not enough yeah, to look at the density matrix. It's really not so often appreciated, yeah, but the you will not see, if I give you a density matrix, I will not be able to tell you whether the system is in or out of equilibrium. Yeah? Because essentially, very simply, every density operator can be written as the exponential of something else, of a Hermitian operator. Yeah? The real question that you have to answer is, does this H up there 
coincide with the generator of dynamics. Uh, is this H what stands in a Heisenberg equation of motion and is there nothing else yeah, that really that would actually be uh, generators of dynamics like the Lindbladian that push you away from this limit. And in order to assess this question uh, practically, you really need to look at correlation functions that indeed see that there is a gen which generator of dynamics is acting there, so it requires you to look at dynamical correlation functions. Yeah? Any static correlation function that you can generate from the density matrix alone, so xx correlations, xx prime correlations, they will not tell you whether the system is in or out of equilibrium, but in the moment you look at dynamical correlation functions, you will see what the generator of dynamics is, and there you have a chance of um, detecting in or out of equilibrium in stationary state. Okay, good. So, a um, bit more systematically, yeah? so another, yeah? That's a very good point, yeah? but again, or th th that's not clear. Yeah? So, Which although then you know it's not no, you can have long-range Hamiltonians. <laughs> well, not really. I mean, <laughs> no. I, I, I think I mean locality of the Hamiltonian is a natural property, and um, that that's an argument that that is often often said. I can just give you an opinion. Yeah? So, so I mean so. I mean, that's, it can be that out of equilibrium, this H is highly non-local. Yeah? So that, that the density matrix, I can represent it always as I said, yeah? but maybe then out of equilibrium, this H is always non-local. Yeah? I just say this is not a good watershed because first, there is long-range Hamiltonians in equilibrium, and second, I don't know many good examples that this Hamiltonian really is non-local. Yeah? In, instead, I know many examples yeah, where even this uh, density matrix in simple Gaussian problems. Yeah, so very often you observe that the, the density matrix is written as an e to the and then some local quadratic form, even in the out of equation. So I'm only I'm not saying it's it's impossible that it's long range. I'm just saying it's not a good criterion because there's always counter examples. Okay, so speaking about this watershed question, yeah, another thing that, that is often, I mean, said is that ah, the open system character is what makes the system out of equilibrium. But this is also not a good distinction criterion because, or, or so to say, the, the, the point that we are making here is mainly irreversibility of the dynamics. But also this is not a good um, quantifier of out of equilibrium conditions. There's plenty of examples, yeah, so including, I mean, a phonon bath in a piece of condensed matter that you leave alone. Yeah, so this is an open system for the, say, fermionic degrees of freedom to which these um, phonon modes are coupled. Yeah, so, and it's a perfectly equilibrium situation. Yeah, there's a detailed balance between the phonons and the fermions. So, and the fermions, they look very irreversible because they are damped by the photons, phonons. So what is really the important point of distinction yeah, is that the system is actually driven and open at the same time. Yeah? And that is what I want to emphasize. And a very good physical picture, a very simple but good physical picture, is that we will encounter non-equilibrium conditions whenever we confuse the system in such a way by coupling it to different bathes that it actually doesn't know which bath to thermalize to. So this is really the important physical ingredient, yeah? and we'll make this now mathematically sharp, but this is the picture you should have in mind. Yeah? So, and this is precisely the situation we were depicting. Yeah? So I have a many-body system, and you may look at this single particle pump, the single particle losses, and the two-body losses as just coupling it to different bathes. These bathes have nothing to do with each other. You can tune their parameters as you like, and this is a circumstance that confuses the system and doesn't allow it to thermalize to one of these bathes. And that, that is, I mean, how I would qualitatively see, aha, uh -huh, this is really a driven open system yeah, where, have, where we have different, different uh, dynamical resources acting on the system which don't allow it to thermalize. 
But now let's try to make this sharp, yeah? so this, this intuition. Was there a question? No. Um, right, so um, we start again from this uh, Keldish functional integral, and um, we look at the situation now where we switch off this dissipator completely, just for, for the sake of, of understanding something. Yeah. So then we reduce the problem to a Heisenberg evolution. We can still path integral, quantize that. Yeah. And then I make the statement yeah, so that the action that results when we put the dissipation to zero, the, the Lindblad, Lindblad dissipation to zero, then you can see that the action that remains, yeah, this SH, that in case the Hamiltonian operator is time independent, it enjoys a funny symmetry that is written down here. Yeah? So this symmetry sends time to, reverses the direction of time. It also shifts time into the complex plane. Yeah? No matter what this, and, and it reverses uh, the sign of I. And it has the property that it squares to one. So it's a discrete uh, symmetry. And, um, no matter, yeah, so I have no good feeling what this symmetry means, but it's just an interesting observation that the action discarding the, the, the dissipation for a time independent Hamiltonian has this symmetry. And the important question is not why is there this symmetry, but the important question is what is the consequence of the symmetry? Yeah? And this is the presence, there is, so to say, ward identities associated to this symmetry. So which are the fluctuation dissipation theorems of thermodynamic equilibrium. So just to remind you how the argument goes here, so we start, say, from an observable, you know, which we can write as a functional of um, these fields, say, on Keldish fields, and we write this as a functional integral, this expectation value, weighted with the action S, yes. then, I mean, I do a, I just do a transformation of the integration variables. This I can always do. Let's take a unitary transformation of the integration variables. And we speak of a symmetry under the following circumstance. First, the action is left invariant under this transformation T, meaning S of T phi is the same as S of phi. And also we require for a symmetry in a quantum field theory that the functional measure is invariant under this transformation. And then we can actually go back to this formulation to see that the consequence of a symmetry of the action is an invariance of this observable O. Yeah. O, symmetry transformed, averaged with respect to the action that is symmetric, gives the same as the action, uh, as the observable without this transformation applied. And if you do this idea, if you implement this idea just for this funny symmetry transformation here, you find this relation here between correlation functions, yeah? correlation and response functions. And that is really, so this O would be the phi C phi C and the phi C phi Q. Yeah? So, so this O is just some polynomial of, of the fields that are in this, in this problem. And um, this idea of having this symmetry implies a strict relation between the correlation functions that we discussed, yeah? so the measure of how, how far do we go away from a deterministic limit and the response functions of this problem. Yeah? And universally, if this symmetry is present here, there is a relative factor between the Keldish and the, uh, between the correlations and the response function, which is the Bose distribution function. Yeah? And this kind of emergent out of this symmetry consideration, we dis rediscover essentially the Bose distribution as the function that governs the particle occupation of a system, uh, of a bosonic system. If it would do the same for fermions, we would have not um, the Bose distribution, but the Fermi distribution function. Yeah? So systems at equilibrium have this symmetry, and that implies a very strict relation between correlation and response functions. Yeah? 
Okay. And the point is, yeah, so whenever I take now a Lindblad operator, I check for the symmetry, it's not there. Yeah? So it's just massive, massively violated, and that tells us, so, aha, uh -huh, I can just, you give me your action, and I will test for the presence of the symmetry. I don't know where this action comes from. I, I just have to test for the symmetry to be sure that um, the, the system is not um, at equilibrium, yeah? or, or it is at equilibrium. Yeah? Because, I mean, maybe this, this piece here, yeah, so this uh, correlation and response function relation, yeah, so this holds beyond the single particle correlation, but it holds for any order, and so it is equivalent to, I mean, all subsystems being in equilibrium with each other, so the system really is in global thermal equilibrium. So this, this is really the symmetry be behind equilibrium conditions. Okay, questions for this? Yeah. Sorry? Now, any order means that, I mean, I, I can give you the, the, I write correlation functions of, say, third order in the field and response function of third order in the field, and there will always be a kind of relation yeah, for the whole hierarchy of correlation functions. Yeah? So it's really a property of total theory and not just of low order correlation functions. Yeah? Sorry? The functional differential equation for this symmetry. I mean, I, I think you are thinking of this word identities or? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, word identity, I put it in quote and quote yeah, because this is something that usually is working for, for continuous symmetries where you have a meaning of, of a close connection and you can, I mean, something that is close to something else and you can work with differential operators. This is a discrete symmetry. Nevertheless, I mean, that's, I put it quote and quote, yeah, but you can extract a useful constraint from the presence of the symmetry. So it's not exactly a word identity in the sense of this BRST or what maybe you have this in mind. Uh, it's not in this sense, but uh, it is, um, I mean, where you, something that you can useful constraints derive from that. No, no, no. I mean, we, 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 we do this idea that I, that I go give you down there, we apply exactly this idea, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Just there is no, no infinitesimal representation for this. There is no infinitesimal generator for this symmetry because it squares to one. Um, I mean, if you like, you can look at the single particle Green's function as a linear response. Yeah? It's linear in this quantum field. Yeah? Uh, and in that sense, it is precisely linear response. I was saying, I mean, there's also higher order correlation, generalizations of that, so it also holds in the nonlinear response. You also get constraints. Yeah? Okay. Good. So last thing I would like to do yeah, is the, um, the semi-classical limit of this uh, symmetry, yeah? and here we can go again by, by this idea, okay, it, there is a shift in the complex time plane, which I can always write as uh, an exponential, as a kind of a generator that uh, does this shift for us. Yeah? And in the semi-classical limit, yeah, so intuitively this is, for an equilibrium system, this is large temperatures, so I can expand this exponential function here, and then I apply the symmetry transformation to this uh, Keldish and classical, uh, to these Keldish fields here, I do the power counting and I realize, okay, this occurrence of the quantum field is again something that is irrelevant in the sense of the randomization group. So this transformation here is the semi-classical limit of this uh, equilibrium symmetry transformation. And I'm pointing this out because it has a beautiful and very simple geometric interpretation for this equilibrium symmetry. Yeah? So, and, and this comes here, yeah, so that's the point I still would like to make. So we have now this action yeah, with only linear and quadratic terms in the, um, in the, in the quantum fields. Yeah. And this action here consists of uh, reversible dynamics and irreversible dynamics coming with a relative i. Yeah. And uh, both of these reversible and irreversible uh, generators here, I can write them in terms of a Landau theory. Landau expansion, yeah, where the most important term is quadratic, yeah, so, and it comes as a mass term, constant term, then there's gradient terms, and then there's interaction terms. And, um, but 
they come with this relative factor of i. Yeah? And so what I'm doing here, I'm plotting in a complex plane of couplings. Yeah? So all the couplings now have real and imaginary parts <laughs> according to this here. I'm just plotting real and imaginary parts of these couplings in the complex plane of these couplings. Yeah? So for example, if we have now two body processes, the real part of lambda of the two body process yeah, is just really elastic two body collisions. And the imaginary part of it is inelastic two body losses. Yeah, so that's what we are describing. And so I make for the real part, I make a, a sketch down here and for the imaginary part, this axis. Yeah? And now I go through all these parameters in this landau ginzburg functional to get here a plot in, uh, of, of the complex couplings here in the, or couplings in the complex plane. Where the real part is reversible and the uh, imaginary irreversible. And now comes the interesting point. If we have a system that is in thermodynamic equilibrium, so it obeys this special symmetry that we were talking, including in the equilibrium, uh, in the uh, in the semi-classical limit, then the implication of this symmetry is also a geometric one yeah, in the sense that all the couplings, they have to be aligned on a single ray in the complex plane. While in a non-equilibrium situation, yeah, so I take a Lindblad equation, take the semi-classical limit, these couplings will just spread out somewhere in this complex plane. Yeah, and this um, has also a very good physical reason yeah, so imagine I have a system that is at equilibrium and um, I have at the microscopic level then only a time independent Hamiltonian as what generates the dynamics. Yeah? So then the picture would be this yeah, in this complex plane of couplings. On the microscopic level, all the couplings, yeah, they are purely real because I only have a Hamiltonian generator of dynamics. So they must all be aligned on the real axis. Yeah? Now I start to coarse grain this problem. I zoom out in an RG spirit, yeah? and it is clear that, I mean, even a system at equilibrium yeah, can show dissipation. Yeah? The system acts as its own bath. It wants to thermalize. And what this does in the RG language, thermalization, is kind of this phenomenon, yeah? so that these couplings acquire finite imaginary parts, but the way they inquire these imaginary parts is not without rules. Yeah? You will never generate a situation, yeah? and, and that's more a, a statement that follows from this analysis than that it's obvious, but if the system microscopically has only a Hamiltonian generator of dynamics, then you will see that at all scales, yeah, the couplings will remain aligned. Yeah? And in particular, at a critical point, yeah, you have even this phenomenon that it's totally overdamped, yeah, and all the real parts are going away. Yeah? So on the way from the microscopic to the macroscopic scale at the critical point, yeah, you lose completely the information of the microscopic reversible dynamics and the system becomes totally overdamped. And the most important point is really that in an equilibrium situation, yeah, so this equilibrium symmetry really tells you that um, all these couplings uh, remain aligned while out of equilibrium, yeah, so this is not the case. And right, so that um, would bring me, I think I have to stop. <laughs> I don't want to overdo it, but I take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, right, so, so one of these, yeah, you can take it as really the, the, imag the imaginary contribution to the self-energy, yeah, yeah. So this is part of it, yeah, and so in the single particle sector is the self-energy, in the two particle sector is something else. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry? To me, it's not really clear what is the mathematical justification of this uh, consequence of equilibrium. The, what, what the uh, mathematical the geometric, justification is? Uh, um, interpretation of the coupling, all, which are all aligned. Well, I mean, you, <laughs> you can look at, I mean, you apply the, the symmetry transformation to an action yeah, in the semi-classical limit, and then you ask, when is the action left invariant? Yeah? 
And you find that it's only left invariant if all the couplings, yeah, so essentially it is this relation, if all the couplings are on one ray, or in other words, when this HC is proportional HD. Yeah? So, and HC and HD are really this complicated, I mean, are these, um, these objects yeah, that make together make up the action. So you can see that this action, it has a contribution from reversible and from irreversible dynamics, right? And each of them, I can expand them in this Landau spirit, yeah, in low powers of the fields. Yeah. And a statement that when everyone is aligned is the statement that these two functionals are really the same up to one common proportional constant. Uh, and this is the circumstance, only if this is realized, uh, then the action is symmetric under this transformation. So that is the logic of the argument. It's clear now? Okay. Yeah, let's say the last one, because we are a bit... I think it's a bit stupid, but if there is a symmetry, I guess there is a charge, which is conserved. Which not, not, no, only if you have a, a continuous, yeah? so the neuter charge, yeah? so there is no, no neuter charge for that. Yeah? Not that I would know, I mean, <laughs> as a not, we don't expect it. Yeah? So. All right, I think we deserve a lunch. Right, we, we, sorry for going a bit over time, and, and one thing, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm not yet through with the physics application, so maybe I, I give a start with a little bit of that in the afternoon, and then we go to these measurements. Or I can also go on with this fear for, for, <laughs> for the rest. So what, would you prefer to see the measurement stuff or slowly through this? Um, yeah. So uh, other votes for measurements, say? So what are we voting for? Like, like say, I mean, so should I slowly go on with this, or should I briefly summarize some consequences of this and then move to the measurements? Okay, more on this. Raise your hands. Uh huh. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked, <laughs> I guess, whether I should go slowly yeah, on this line here, or I should uh, summarize this and then we go to, to this measurement uh, business. So more like measurement induced phase yeah, transitions right, yeah, yeah. in a, maybe as an alternative point, uh, point of view as to what Sun Wan was explaining. Exactly, yeah. Right. I mean, so more a Keldish formulation. Keldish formalism, let's say, uh, point of view on this phase transition. Let's vote again. More on the, let's say, just open systems and application. Raise your hand. Well, okay. And more on the measurement induced phase transition. Uh, the second one won. Thank so. You, the second one won. So I will briefly summarize uh, this and then. Okay. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>